And we'll move on to David Prieto, who is going to help us compete with the with the presentations next door because it's like heavy methodology. <laughs> <laughs> David is a statistician uh, who is based here as well as at UCL as, as well as in Spain. Um, and he's uh, recently taken on uh, this topic and this domain after working a lot on big data and clinical trials and pharmacovigilance. Okay, well, David. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, so, well, I have, I have to apologize first because I don't know much about um, non-communicable diseases, or I don't know anything about non-communicable diseases, probably. <laughs> and I don't know much about challenging settings. I work in a very uh, comfortable setting. Uh, I, well, most of my job is up the road in uh, UCL. At UCL, we work in the institute, FAR Institute for Electronic Health Records. So we analyze loads of data. I, I kind of swim in a wealth of data. So I don't have all these problems that I'm listening here about lack of data and bad data, things like that. My data is pretty good. Uh, so I don't know what I'm doing here. I should be the next <laughs> talking to those guys there. But the thing is, I, I came across Bayard and Pablo and Kieran, and we've worked together in, in some things, and they asked me to do a couple of things. Oh, thanks, sorry. Um, so I, th and I think this is actually a more challenging and more interesting setting than next door. <laughs> don't tell them. <laughs> um, so, so when I was preparing this, because I'm not an expert on, on, on these two things, sensitivities and challenging settings, I thought I will talk about myself and tell you my story. Um, my story in this particular <laughs> uh, problems. So the thing is that wh from what we've seen here, it transpires that there is a lack of evidence in how we, in what we know about NCDs in humanitarian settings, right? And challenging settings. Now, to produce evidence, you need two things. You need data, good data, and analysis of that data. Right. Now, I'm in the analysis part of the data. Now, statisticians, when they do the analysis of the, of the data, they assume the data has certain properties. You've collected the data with certain quality, right? And, um, and they normally blame you if they don't do it. And if you don't get what you want, they blame you even more. So it's always the blame is always on the data. So we tend to do that. Um, so the thing is that most of our statistical methods assume some qualities in that data, some good qualities of the data that you've collected. And I realized very soon, very early, that in these settings, you cannot rely on those, on, on those assumptions. So you have to improvise. You cannot rely on the standard methods that you take off the shelves and you read on the books. So um, I might disappoint you. I'm not going to tell you about super innovative statistical methods. I'm just going to tell you about the old methods and how we try to adapt the old methods to data that is not excellent and very good data. So, um, so I might talk about two, two, two examples that I've been involved in. One is the estimation of the prevalence of uh, disease diabetes in a population where we don't have access to the population. And the other word is trying to generate some evidence, trying to measure the effectiveness of an intervention in, in a refugee camp where you cannot do a randomized clinical trial. If you want to um, generate evidence on the efficacy or the effectiveness, I never remember the word, of an intervention, uh, you should do a randomized clinical trial. That's what it says in, in all books of epidemiology and statistics. But that's not always possible. So what do you do instead of that? And let's go to the first one, to the prevalence one. So, so Pablo and Bayar, um, sorry, and Kiran came and say, uh, in this um, DRC uh, project, can, we would like to estimate the um, prevalence of diabetes in the population. Um, can you calculate sample size? So quickly calculate the sample size, that was very easy. And then they say, oh, but we cannot just reach individual people. We have to do a cluster survey. You know, we have to go to a village and then get some people in the village and then move to another village. So he recalculate the sample size with a cluster design. And then they say, well, the, 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 the um, security situation has deteriorated. So we cannot just random sampling, get a random sample of villages. We can only go to a few big towns and then get some people very quickly because then we have to move out before the bad guys come in. So uh, we have to kind of <laughs> recalculate again and take into account the biases. And then they came and say, well, we actually cannot leave the hospital. We have to stay in. <laughs> 
So in my statistics book, there is no chapter where it says how to estimate the prevalence of disease in a population where you cannot actually go and survey the population. So we have to kind of improvise things. So, so this is schematically, uh, I've deleted most of the formulas, by the way. What we want to do, we have a population here. Some people have diabetes. This is a health facility. We like to go there and sample people randomly in the population and then just get a proportion of them that have diabetes among my sample, right? This is how you normally do. But you cannot do that. You have to stay in your health facility and let people come in. And you can actually only see the people that you have inside. So how do you calculate the proportion of these guys in the population from this number here? Now, this is what gets interesting, right? I'll give you an example of what we thought about. We thought that, okay, those people, they are all not gonna come into the health facility. So within a period, uh, a window of, of period of time, only a proportion of them, let's call it K1, 10% of them, whatever it is, come into your health facility. Now, that means that this number here is the total number of individuals times that proportion. You multiply a, a proportion of them come into the hospital. So if we knew K1, then we can calculate back the number of people with diabetes in the population. That was very clever, but we don't know K1. <laughs> uh, we know what proportion of people end up. So we thought about something else to say, okay, we might have other diseases in that population that we might know better than diabetes, maybe malaria or something else. A proportion of those people will also come. So we have this H1 that we know, people with diabetes in the hospital, people with this other disease in the hospital, and they both follow these formulas, right? So what about if we divide this one over that one? I started thinking of that because that's what mathematicians do when we don't know what to do. We start dividing things. <laughs> and, um, so. I've deleted the formulas and put everything with, with graphs so people can follow. So this is the number of people with diabetes multiplied by the probability that they will come to the hospital is the number of people with diabetes in the hospital, and this is with the other disease. So if I now do a very complicated move and then put this thing on the other side, right? That goes here, that goes there, that's simple algebra. And this goes there. You get that the number of people with diabetes will be equal to that, multiplied by that, multiplied by that, right? So the number of people with diabetes is equal to the ratio <coughs> of diabetic patients over the other patients in the hospital, multiplied by the ratio of these probabilities of coming and seek help in the hospital from these two kind of patients, multiplied by the number of people with the other disease in the population. Now, if you divide these by population n, this turns out to be the prevalence of diabetes in the population. That turns out to be the prevalence of the other disease in the population. Now, I still need to find this, and this is data that I can get from the hospital. This I don't know, and that I don't know. But if I think about it carefully, the first bit here is the probability of seeking um, health um, um, service from patients of these two different diseases, right? So I, f I have to figure out this ratio. I could give numbers to the, I could guess numbers for that ratio and do different estimations. Or maybe I can think, well, maybe they are the same. Maybe patients from diabetes and from these other disease will have the same probabilities of ending up in the hospital, so this is just one, right? And the other bit of unknown information is the prevalence of disease two in the population. Now, the good thing here, the trick here, is to choose a disease that you actually know was the prevalence in this population from previous studies. So let's say malaria is a very well studied disease or HIV, for instance. So by putting something here and putting something in there from previous studies, then you go back to the formula, you have that one, that one, and that one, and you have an estimate of the prevalence of, of that diabetes in the population without leaving the hospital, yeah? That's the kind of thing. We haven't tested this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is the kind of things that you will have to get your statistician to do if you hire one of them to help you <laughs> in these very complicated <laughs> settings, right? Um, the good thing about that, I, I, then I got excited about this. I say, oh, what about if, if, if you know a particular disease, you can turn the question around. If, if you know the prevalence of a disease, and, and maybe you have uh, in two different towns and the prevalence of the disease is similar in both towns. But you're not sure about uh, how people seek um, 
uh, health um, services, assistance in both towns, how often they come to their hospital from both towns. It could be a very interesting question to see if there are difference between different, different human groups in seeking your, your, your health services, right? So if you actually know the, the prevalence of, the, the, of the disease in these groups, then your unknown could be this thing here, the ratio of the probability of going to the hospital between two groups. And, and these, would be the unknown, these would be the known thing, you put it on the other side of the equation, and this is observed, that's, that's known, and then you can get whether in one location people are more able to go to your hospital than in another location. Three minutes, oh my God. Okay. All right. So I might not get to the end of the presentation. But, um, so advantage of this is obviously you don't have to, to leave the hospital. Uh, you don't have to go there. You can do a certifications of your estimations by patient characteristics like age, sex, residence, a lot of things. Uh, you can use information from uh, previous information for nearby, from nearby facilities, nearby populations, historical information to inform the parameters. Uh, you can do continuous monitoring of prevalence over time without having to repeat very expensive surveys out there in the population. And if you had a reasonable, uh, reasonable knowledge on the prevalence, then you can turn the question around and try to estimate you know, how, how often people go and seek help for the problems. Yeah. The other, the, the, the other example I want to give is how do you estimate the efficacy of an intervention when you cannot do a randomized clinical trial? And this is an example of we're a project in a refugee camp in, in Lebanon. And the intervention is, is can you say this? Yeah? OK. It's not a secret, state secret. Yeah. It's used in the polyfill, for instance, for, for CBD patients, right? Um, but you cannot randomize individual patients. You have to give it to the whole area, to the whole camp, or not give it. To what we were thinking of doing is, is um, interrupted time series analysis. So this is an outcome. Let's say this was blood pressure or whatever it is. And you divide your period of observation between in, in two periods. Control periods before you put the intervention, that's the intervention, and after you do the intervention, intervention period. And basically, you compare the time series of something that you want to monitor. In this case, it will be kind of blood pressure, for instance, or adherence to the, to the, to the drug. Before the intervention, we have to do it. You check how it changes. It might change with a change in the slope or, or with a sudden change in the level, right? And this is a method called um, interrupted time series analysis. But you want to have a control group because there could be circumstances that make people change over time. Maybe when you did your intervention, something else happened, some political situation or war situation happened. So you ideally want to have another site where you're doing the same thing without the intervention. And then you compare the change in this side with the change in that side. Yeah. So these are basically two, this a uh, way where you try to, this has several advantages because you use the same group before and after, so they are self-control. Yeah. That takes away a lot of compounding. And, and, the, and the main confounders could be things that change over time. But to control for that, you use another, another, another group. And, and you don't kind of randomize individual people, you do it at the community level, okay? And, and I think that's it. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, David. I think it, I'm sorry that we had to keep it short, yeah, but I think there, there's a lot to say there, and, and <coughs> there are some good insights. Any clarification questions before I hand over to David for the David for the main discussion? No.